Oh. So, <laughs> I always forget to press the button. So, who's Paris? I bet you're wondering. What a great question. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful segue into who Paris is, which is a kind of older guy who wants to marry Juliet. Do you guys see how old Juliet is? No. Yeah, she's almost 14, right? She's like 13.99. Her birthday will be in two weeks. So she's not even 14. Like a pedophile right now. Uh, well, you know, back then they didn't look at it like that. That's a weird question, but it's a good point. Um, it wasn't illegal back then because back then basically when a woman went through like her time of the month for the first time, that meant she was ready to have babies. And if she's ready to have babies, she's ready to be married off. So it was really common for people who were 12, 13, 14 to be getting married. Any serious questions, you can raise your hand and ask. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep lecturing straight through and remember that we're going to not talk. Paris wants to marry Juliet because he's kind of a gold digger. You know, I'm, I'm not saying he's a gold digger, but he sort of is. And Juliet is the wealthiest of all the eligible bachelorettes, right? So she is someone that's like hot, young, healthy, and rich. So that would help advance Paris's status in the um, in Verona as well. Lord and Lady Capulet, Juliet's parents, they're like, oh, we definitely want Paris to marry our daughter because he's easily you're tapping the book. <laughs> he's like, why is she pointing at me? <laughs> um, the Capulets want a, a kind of a a son-in-law who's easily sort of like malleable, you know. Paris is like that guy who marries the CEO's daughter, not because he wants the daughter, but because he wants to become from low level management to, you know, CEO. So he's like, of course, sir. Yes, what a great idea, sir. You have such a lovely family. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And it's like, he, Paris is the same way. Paris will kind of do whatever Capulet says. So that means that Juliet can still be under their 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 reign you know imagine if Juliet were to be married off to some like guy that she fell in love with how could Capulet control that relationship he couldn't right he you know what if they move or what if you know they he tells Juliet to go to college or something like I mean not like they could even do that back then but you know like that could be out of his control so instead he's like Paris I want you to marry her too but there's going to be kind of a caveat yes you can marry her but so that's what we're going to be reading um, right now in this very short scene. So you will be playing Paris, I will be Capulet, and you were kind of cutting in on their conversation that they already are having. Sorry, could you pass my water? Sorry. Um, they're cutting into the conversation that they're already having, which is that the prince, thank you so much, has basically threatened them with what? What's going to happen when... <laughs> it's so hard to drink. Even like drinking water in front of people, it just becomes like a thing, you know? Um, what did Par uh, what did the prince threaten the Montagues and Capulets with? Death, right? If you fight again, we will put you to death. So Capulets like, I'm not ready to die. So we got to figure this out. We got to stop our, our children from fighting. But it's sort of like he made this beast and now the beast is out of control, right? Capulet and Montague, remember from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, right? The old beef has turned into new beef, right? And it's not even the good quality beef. It's like that 85% ground beef, you know, that you, you know, it's not even the good stuff. So it's like, why did you, get it, beef, ha <laughs> like a grudge, beef, you know, like you got beef with me. Thank you, it was such a great joke. Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> it's been a long day, okay? It's the last period of the day. Um, so, now that the old people they're old now they don't they're not old enough to like they're too old to fight they're they're not like young and able to have sword fights and live to tell the tale so now they're trying to like calm the tensions but the problem is you started a fire you can't put out you know it's like if say the bloods and the crypts tomorrow were to be like you know what i've decided let's just be friends you know it's all good let's just let's not fight anymore do you think they could just be like Hey, what's up, whole world? Um, we're not going to fight anymore. Okay, bye. And then just expect it to work? No, right? Just because the older people want it, it doesn't change all the rest of the people in that, you know, that, that comes after that. And so now Paris and Tybalt and Romeo and Benvolio, they're in it. 
You know, like what uh, what Jim said to Scout in Mockingbird. You're in it. You're in it now, Miss Pris. You're in it now, and you can't get out. It's kind of like the same thing, right? They've started the fighting, and they got to figure it out. So Capulet, we're breaking in on this conversation that he's like, we got to figure out how to, like, stop the fighting. But Montague is bound, as well as I, in penalty alike. And it's not hard, I think, for men so old as we to keep the peace. Of honorable reckoning are you both. And pity, pity tis, you lived on odds so long. But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? <sighs> By saying o'er what I've said before, my child is it a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of fourteen years. Let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think her ripe to be a bride. Younger than she, our happy mother's maid. <laughs> and too soon marred are those so early made. So Paris is like, I mean, I've seen girls who are younger than her who are already, what? Married. M married and? Mothers. mothers, right? So, like, they have already been, you know, like, having this life that I'm just now asking if Juliet can start. And Capulet's like, yeah, I've seen those women too. And you'll see in the film version, he looks right at Juliet's mom. He's like, yeah, I know someone like that. And then he says, and too soon marred are those so early made, right? Like, yeah, I've seen those too, and they're ruined. And I don't want that to happen to my daughter. Earth hath swallowed all my hopes but she. She's the hopeful lady of my earth. But woo her, gentle Paris, get her heart. My will to her consent is but a part. And she agreed within her scope of choice lies my consent and fair according voice. <laughs> this night, I hold an old accustomed feast, whereto I've invited many a guest such as I love, and you among the store, one more most welcome makes my number more. At my poor house, look to behold this night earth treading stars that make dark heaven light. Such comforts as do lusty young men feel when well apparelled April on the heel of limping winter treads. Even such delight among fresh fennel buds shall you this night inherit at my house. Here all I'll see, and like her most, whose merit most shall be. <laughs> Which, on more view of many mine, being one, may stand in number, though in reckoning none. <laughs> Come, go with me. And so he, and that's where Paris kind of exits, but you'll be reading someone else in a second. I'm going to have you read. Uh... Yeah, perfect. You read my mind. I didn't even know I was thinking that. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of briefly go through with what Capulet said, because it is important, especially because it's not going to be like this forever. Capulet said, well, who, who actually, I, I bet you guys know. Who can paraphrase what Capulet said? Can I pause this? No. You forgot the word? It's one word. Uh, his whole sonnet could be just like summed up in one word. Win her heart. Oh, I like that. In one phrase, right? Win her heart, right? Seduce. That could be the one word, right? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So he's like, you know what? You can marry my daughter, but you got to wait how many years? Two. two years. And yeah, it's like two summers wither in their pride, which is such a beautiful way of saying it, right? You can kind of picture the summer blooming and then withering and, you know, again, and that's like the passage of time. See how Shakespeare, he says this fancy stuff because if he was like, no, wait two years, that wouldn't be a very interesting play, would it? They'd be like, we paid this for that, you know? So he also says, you know, woo her, get her heart. My will to her consent is but a part. My consent is only one part of this. You got to also woo her. And then he says, tonight, what's he having at his house? Feast. Yeah, he's having a feast. And that's going to be like a really fun party. It's going to be lit AF. And they're going to just have all these hot girls. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do you a favor. There's going to be tons of beautiful Fresh fennel buds, little new women, like, you know, just like, you know, right on the cusp of, you know, going out and getting married. I want you to hear all and all see and like her most whose merit most shall be. I want you to see them all, talk to them all. Sunglasses off, please. Um, and like the one that is the most um, meritable, like like the one who, who is the most um, deserving of your love and you know what you're gonna meet mine and i know she's gonna be the best but maybe not for you so let's just see how it goes this is not gonna be how he continues to to feel throughout the 
the play. So kind of like notice that. Okay, so then he gives a paper to a serving man and he's like, I need you to go invite my friends to this party. And he can't like send a text message and he can't even like send it through the mail because like that would take days. There'd be like a pony involved and it would just take too long. So you just go and you're like, you give it to your serving man and he just goes and invites people. So he, so the serving man, which is, you're gonna play, gets the, the paper, but something's wrong. He can't read. Uh oh, what? Yeah, he's yeah, he's exactly right. And it's like kind of funny that this whole thing has to do with really what Giselle just said. His illiterateness, his illiteracy, his inability to be literate is the kind of reason that Romeo and Juliet end up meeting, right? Like they're opposite sides of, of everything. Star crossed lovers they should have never met. But because this serving guy can't read who's supposed to he's supposed to invite he has to find someone who can read and so that's where what where you're gonna start okay so oh sorry wait uh capulet finishes mm. go serum trudge about through fair verona he gives him the paper trudge about through fair verona find these persons out whose names are here written and to them say my house and welcome on their pleasure stay <coughs> Find them out whose names are written here. It is written that the shoemaker should meddle with this with his yard and the tailor with his lath, the fisher with his pencil and the painter with his nets. But I am sent to find those persons whose name whose names are here writ, and never find what names the writ, the the writing person hath here writ. I must to be I must to the learn. In good time. I got to get to the learned. I must find someone who knows, right? Who's learned how to read. So how convenient. Enter Benvolio and Romeo. Um, this one, I just for, since I'm recording, I will read since I'm the closest to the mic. It's just going to be easier because I have to interpret it like every few lines. Okay. So this one, and I'm only reading this scene. We're going to watch 1.3 because um, we don't have time to read it today. But it will be on video. Um, so Benvolio and Romeo are walking and the serving man runs into him and, uh, Romeo, uh, says, is, is talking to Benvolio still about how much he loves Rosalind and how he's, oh, that's her name, by the way, Rosalind, that will come up later. Um, and Benvolio is just still giving him advice. Tut, man, one fire burns out another's burning. One pain is lessened by another's anguish. Turn giddy and be back from... Turn giddy and be helped by backward turning. One desperate grief cures with another's languish. Take thou some new infection to thy eye, and the rake poison of the old will die. You have an infection in your eye, or your eye got poisoned. Oh my God, my eye has been poisoned. Help, my eye is poisoned. And the doctor's like, mm, well, I have an idea. What if we infect it with uh, something else? Mm, if we give your eye uh, a bacteria infection, uh, it might kill the poison. But are we talking about eyes and infections? No, we're talking about women, right? And women be cray, you know? Like, they are kind of like a poison in a way. They kind of infect our eyes. We can't stop looking at them, thinking about them. It's like, it's like all consuming. So what is he saying? How can you get over this woman? What's his advice? Yeah, find a different one. There's plenty of fish in the sea. You're young, attractive, rich. There's tons of women who, who would be happy to have you. Then he, Romeo makes a joke about your plantain leaf from lines 52 uh, to 60. I'm just going to skip because even if I explain this joke for five minutes, it wouldn't make any sense or be funny. So why would I waste your time? There's a couple things in Shakespeare that like not every single line's a winner, you know, and maybe it was funny 400 years ago, but not today. So starting at line 61, the serving man sees Romeo and Benvolio and says what? Oh, we were all sitting. God evening, I pray, sir. Can you read? I, mine own fortune and my misery. He's like, yeah, I can read. I can read that I'm going to be miserable for the rest of my life. Perhaps you have learned it without book. But I pray, can you read anything you see? I, if I know the letters and the language. You say honestly, rescue Mary. 
Stay, fellow. I can read. He reads the letter. And, and for you guys that uh, are reading this, you might not recognize these names. You might recognize a couple, so be on the lookout. But you will see that Romeo recognizes one, and that's what's important. Stay, fellow. I can read. He reads the letter. Senor Martino and his wife and daughters, County Aislinn and his beauteous sisters, Lady Widover Trudvio, Senor Placentio, his lovely nieces, Mercutio, his brother Valentin, my uncle Capulet, his wife and daughters, my fair niece, <gasps> Rosaline, and Livia, Senor Valencio and his cousin Tibble, or Senor Valentio, his cousin Tibble, Lucio, the lively Helena. Hmm. A fair assembly. Whither should they come? And inside, he just read that Rosalind's going to be there. And he's like, oh my God, the person that I love is going to be there. And so he's trying to play it cool right now. Like, hmm, you know, interesting, interesting guest list. Where, where, where's all this happening? Where's this going down? And the serving man, it's kind of like, like it's like a little bit of a comedic moment where the serving man kind of is like so dumb he doesn't even like answer the question. He's just like answering the question with more like vagueness. So a fair assembly, whither should they come? Oh. Whither? To supper? To our house. <sighs> Whose house? My master's. Indeed. I should have asked thee that before. <laughs> now I'll tell you without asking. My master is the great rich Capulet. And if you be not of the house of the Montagues, I pray come and crush a cup of wine. If you be not of the house of what? Uh-oh. Romeo's not just of the house of Montague. He is Montague. You know, he's the Montague. He's the prodigal son, right? Um, so when you see that, you know, he's invited to this, you might be thinking, uh, this is not a good idea, Romeo. But he is so sprung off that girl, right? He's hungry for a snack. And that snack is that one girl he just can't get over. And so he goes to Benvolio and he's like, oh my God, I'm so excited. Like Rosalind's gonna be there, right? And Benvolio's like, oh my God, did you see that Rosalind's gonna be there? <laughs> well, let me show you a lesson. At this same ancient feast of Capulet, sups the fair Rosaline, whom thou so <laughs> loves. <laughs> With all the admired beauties of Verona, <laughs> go thither. And with unattained eye, compare her face with some that I shall show. And I will make thee think thy swan a crow. She is going to look disgusting next to the hot bayest bays in the bay that I show you. And so you'd think that Romeo would be like, oh, thank you so much for like looking out for me and like introducing me to other girls that you know I can Netflix and chill with I truly appreciate it but no he's so stuck on this girl he gets mad at Benvolio and just the idea that Benvolio could even know girls that are hotter than this girl is like crazy to him like how dare you uh, when the devout religion of mine I maintain such falsehood huh, then turn tears to fire and those who often drowned could never die. Transparent heretics be burnt for liars. One fair, then my love, ha! The all-seeing sun never saw her match since the first world begun. Ha! My eyes, if they lie to me, they maintain that falsehood. Burn them in their sockets. Well, I'm alive. I'll take, they deserve it. And I love how he describes eyes. He says, those who often drowned could never die. You see how like your eyes, they're always drowning, right? Because they're always covered in water and like rolling around in our head. So that those who often drown but could never die, transparent heretics, people who talk against the king, people, and this time the king is Rosalind, you know, the queen, be burnt for liars. So he's saying, if my eyes ever lie to me like that, then they, you know, I deserve to have them burnt in their sockets. And um, the, it's so funny because he says the sun has never seen her match since the first world begun. Even the sun, who sees everything, the all-seeing sun, has never seen a match to her hotness. Uh, Benvolio's just watching this whole time, just kind of like shaking his head. Tut, 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 you saw her fair, none else being by, herself poised with herself in either eye. But in that crystal scales, let there be weighed your lady's love against some other maid that I will show you shining at this fest. And she scant show well that now seems best. And Romeo is like, I'll go along. No such sight to be shown, but to rejoice in splendor of mine own. 
fine, I'll go, but only to see Rosalind, not to meet another girl. So we're ending our reading there. I wanted to point out in that second to last line, line 105 to 106, I will show you shining at this. So it looks like it should be feast, right? You see how, right? But because it's rhymed with best, you know it's pronounced fest. So something that I still do, I mean, I don't know how Shakespeare wanted to pronounce these words sometimes, and you could say it different ways, like learned or learned, moved or moved, but sometimes if you look at the line before it or after it, you'll be like, oh, it's supposed to rhyme with best, so it must be fest. But then if it was beast, then you would say it's feast. So when you're, especially like when we start doing more read alouds and you're kind of previewing what you need to read and like not sure how to say it, same with like, um, uh, you know, weighed and made, by and I. So it's just like kind of use those clues to help you. Use those clues. See, I'm rhyming right now. Okay, so we're going to